Now, in the section on the economic foundations of the development of Europe, I painted a very rosy picture. And I did at times try and say, you know, it wasn't always, um, you know, we don't want to think of these people necessarily as rich by our standards. I just want to emphasize things were getting better. But there is something we call the crises of the later Middle Ages, right? So there's going to be some problems, particularly in the 14th century, that we need to note. And these are connected to the economy, but there will be recovery. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's just look at what's going on. So here's a problem. Things were generally getting better in the 12th, 13th centuries. There was more uh, economic production. There was a demand for labor. Things were getting were going well. But remember, as a general rule, as long as there's surplus food, people, the population will increase. The problem is eventually you run out of resources. Um, there's either not land that those new people can farm or the, fa the land is being farmed so much that just putting more farmers in the fields isn't actually going to get you more food. So at a certain point, and it's, it's based on a lot of different factors and it's a lot of environmental, but also just on the technology available. At a certain point, people, you're not going to be able to produce, more people don't mean more food, more people mean less food. Right. As long as there's open land or as long as you can put more people working on the same land and get more food out of it, population going up, that's fine. But once you get to a certain tipping point, you could say what's going to happen is more people mean less resources, more people mean less food. So that's what happens in the 13th century, later 13th century, early 14th century. We've got population growth. But. This growth is not, does not mean an increase in food production by opening up new lands or having more people work. It leads to a decrease of food per capita. So people are getting less food to eat. To make things worse, in the first quarter of the 1300s, there's what's called a little ice age. Basically, temperatures got colder. That's bad for several reasons. Uh, some land that had been fertile before has now become too cold to grow crops. In other places, it can still grow crops. The growing season is shorter, so they don't get as much of a harvest. So now there's even less food to go around. That leads to famine, right? Uh, there's less food, so people aren't going to get enough to eat. And whenever there's a crop failure, there's no surplus, lots of people are going to starve. And one thing we have to stress is whenever um, people get don't get enough food to eat, that generally leads to an increase in disease. People actually rarely starve to death. What typically happens is people get, uh, their, their immune systems are weakened because they're not getting enough food to eat, and then they get a disease, and that's what kills them. So we're going to have famine, and that makes people vulnerable to disease. And then in 13, beginning in 1347, the Europeans get hit by the plague, what we now today call the Black Death. And it's named this because it led to the growth of bumps on your body that were black in color. But the Black Death, the plague, is terrible, and it hits it would be terrible no matter what, but it hits a Europe that is economically, and especially in terms of food production, is really having a rough time. Uh, the Black Death will continue for decades in Europe. It'll Basically, it'll hit for a while um, and then leave and then will come back and kill more people. And it's, it's just really uh, rotten. It continues for decades. And just to give you some numbers, in England, something like one in three will die. So something like 1.4 million of the population will die. And in some places, this seems to have gone up really high, especially in cities. A city might lose one half to two thirds of its people. So just try and imagine in the, the city of Greenwood, it's about population of 30,000. Imagining losing between 15 and 20,000 people. In a sense, it's unimaginable. I mean, it's just hard to imagine that much death, right? That something like half the city could be destroyed in just a short time. And this disease moved very quickly. I mean, you could be dead, you could catch it and then be dead within a day or two, depending on which form. It had multiple forms. Uh, so this is just really bad. And there were constant complaints that the there were too many dead that the living could not bury them. And as you can guess, civilization would be absolutely devastated by this, right? You, and you can kind of think about this way. What do you do when half the people are dead what happens if the person who delivers you know the people who deliver the mail half of them die it's going to be much harder to get mail what happens when you know the only local pastor dies what are you going to do for your church remember this is an age of faith church is very important 
right? This was really, really devastating to the civilization. So there's this idea we have to rebuild again. So there's going to be this kind of effort to rebuild civilization. And part of that is connected to what's called the Renaissance, right? The Renaissance, I mean, people disagree about when to start it. But a lot of times it start, it's considered to start in the 1300s because of the shock to civilization when half the people die, right? How do you rebuild after that? So what was it, right? What was the Renaissance? It was a willingness to look for new ideas and to get at old ideas to solve the problems people were facing and rebuild civilization. It's kind of like what people were trying to do after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, right? How do we rebuild, right? How do we rebuild? And I have a map of, and it's also connected to an explosion of creativity and innovation. So coming out of the Black Death, out of this terrible plague that kills, you know, like half the population in some areas or more, Europeans say, okay, we can do this. We can figure this out. We're going to figure out a way to make things better, right? We're not going to just recover. We're going to make things better than they were before the Black Death. And so, like I said, there's going to be this explosion of creativity and innovation to make that a reality. Now, this is going to be centered in 14th and 15th century Italy. Why? Right? Why is it centered there? Well, remember, Italy was the center of international trade and banking. Remember how I talked about how the economy was developing in the 11th and 12th and even into the 13th centuries, right? Europe is getting richer. Italy is one of the places that was getting the richest because not only was it able to engage in domestic trade, it controlled a lot of international trade. In addition, using that as kind of a basis, Italian banks opened branches all throughout Europe and made money entering into to, in, in terms of lending um, and so forth. So Italy is becoming a center of international trade and banking, and its economy will recover rather quickly after the Black Death, right? It's, it's got a good foundation, so even though it goes through this terrible period, they're able to recover. And here's the thing, when also we should stress, they're the old center of the Roman Empire, right? Remember I said that in the Renaissance, people are going to look again at old ideas. They're going to be looking back to the Greeks and Romans, with renewed vigor to try and figure out, okay, how do we build a better civilization? And who better to do it than the people who were surrounded by ruins of an ancient civilization, right? If you're uh, in Rome or any of these major cities, you can see the ruins of Rome. Rome is not something that's just there that some professor is talking about. Rome is physically present in the old structures, the ruins of the old empire. So I'll come back to that in a second. So what you have in Italy is you have people who have money, right? You have people who have money who are going to be able to invest in rebuilding civilization. They're going to have money they can invest in a vision to rebuild civilization. And they model that vision in a large part on the Roman Empire and on its Greek heritage, right? So the, the money, in a sense that the, it, it, Italy is making from international trade and banking makes the Renaissance possible, makes the developments possible, right? You can't do much if you don't have money. And Roman Empire, Greco-Roman civilization, the Greeks, all that stuff acts as a source of inspiration. Now, one thing I have to point out here, remember how earlier I mentioned that there's this tendency to say, well, the Middle Ages was an age of faith, and then you've got the Renaissance come along and people suddenly become reasonable. And... A lot of times we talk about religious, about Renaissance humanism. And one issue with that is that we use the word humanism today. Typically, um, an, an atheist or an agnostic might describe themselves as humanist. Say, I'm a humanist. And that's taken to be connected to atheism and agnosticism, meaning I don't believe in God. Or I don't know if we can know if there is a God. But humanism in this time period is religious. And so there's sometimes people who want to take the Renaissance and put it against the earlier medieval period and, and try and make them into opposites. And they weren't. They continued to be religious. If this, and I, I have a, a, an art textbook that talks about, yeah, this, this period was becoming, you know, wasn't very religious. It was more secular. And I'm like, and then it's like, yeah. And then you have this art textbook with all these images of the Virgin Mary <laughs> and Jesus. No, this is a very religious period. 
but there is a change and i'll get to that momentarily so i don't want you to think of this the renaissance okay you know this is rational and not religious the middle ages middle ages was was irrational and religious it's not like that but religious understandings do change but before we talk too much about that i want to talk about a godfather of the renaissance there's this very interesting documentary called godfathers of the renaissance it has some good points bad points but i like the terminology and it's a man named lorenzo de medici right that's lorenzo de medici and lorenzo de medici was heir to a great italian banking family uh, the Medici had not only established a bank in Florence, the town that they were based in, but they had branches all throughout Italy and even in modern day Germany. And they were really good at banking and they made a lot of money. And he was good at the family business too. This guy was a good banker. He knew how to make money. But what's cool about him and, and why I think he's a good way to think about the Renaissance and this connection between business and and knowledge was he used money to support the gathering of books, the, especially books on philosophy and also on the production of great art and architecture, right? So he uses money to support gathering books and he gets like these scholars to go scour the countryside, to get, to scour the whole country, looking for books, looking for lost manuscripts. And a lot of these books he's interested in looking at are philosophy books, books about Greek philosophy or Roman philosophy that maybe people have forgotten about, right? There was only like one copy left and it's in this old monastery library and the monks don't bother reading it because they don't can't read Greek or, you know, they're just not interested. So he sends people around to do that. And he also supports all these great artists and all these great architects. And what's key about this, he wants to find useful knowledge wherever it was and apply it to the present day. So that same openness we saw in Europeans and the universities in the, in the Middle Ages, it's still here. It's still there. I think it's increased. I think it's expanded. But to say that people in the Middle Ages were not interested in finding useful knowledge and, and looking wherever they could to find it is false. They did. It's just in the Renaissance, they did it more, I think. But he wants to find useful knowledge wherever it was and apply it to the present day. And here's the thing you may say, art and architecture, is that useful, right? And we're kind of trained to think it's not, right? Sometimes people make jokes about being an art or music or something like that. Um, but those are actually very important, both in and of themselves. I think art and music are worth pursuing on their own. They also give you certain benefits. As a fun fact, people who learn how to play musical instruments early in life are often good at math. Those two things seem to go together, which I think is really cool. But the idea that Leon, Lorenzo de' Medici had and shared with artists was that art and architecture were useful to education. You use art and architecture to make the good beautiful so we will naturally pursue it. And what's important is a lot of the art and architecture that Lorenzo de' Medici and other Renaissance figures are sponsoring is it's meant to be public. It's stuff that's both meant to be out there for everyone to enjoy. So the purpose is not simply to say, oh, here's some beautiful thing, but to share it and to use it to, in a sense, glorify the values that people like Lorenzo de' Medici thought we should be pursuing. So, for example, a lot of Renaissance art emphasizes harmony. It emphasizes human dignity. It's meant to encourage people to behave in harmonious ways, to act in a dignified manner. We'll make the good beautiful. We want harmony. Let's make beautiful images of, that show harmony and that will encourage people to be harmonious. And when you think about it, the art, the images that you surround yourself with, the music that you listen to all impact your mood and who you are. So art and architecture are very practical, as is music. I've just, the Renaissance, I don't talk as much about music. I focus on the art. But what do we mean by education, right? I said this idea of harmony, of dignity. Well, let's kind of pursue that. One of the major figures that uh, Lorenzo de' Medici supported was a man, a great artist named Michelangelo. And Michelangelo would do things like create the Sistine Chapel. And this is an image from the Sistine Chapel. This is a private, uh, or I'm sorry, it wasn't private, I don't believe. It was a chapel of the Pope. The Pope actually hired him. I'm sorry, this, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici supported Michelangelo, but other people did as well. But I want to focus on this piece of art because it's amazing. There is God creating Adam. 
And we can notice several things. First of all, this is really glorifying Adam. Adam is buff. I mean, the guy just, he's really well built. And remember in art, the relative size and position of the figures is important. God and Adam are about the same size. Adam, if anything, is a little bit bigger. God's a bit taller than Adam, but not that much. And so the idea is this. This is a religious image. I mean, God is making Adam, right? It's, it's portraying something from Genesis. This is a religious image. But what's particularly important about it is it's not emphasizing humanity as a sinner. This isn't an image of Adam and Eve being cast out of paradise. This is Adam when he's being created in all his splendor. This is a celebration of humanity. So that's why this is religious humanism. It's celebrating humanity, but within this idea that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. And in a sense, the idea, when you look at this, the educational factor is to say, yeah, I am a, a human being with dignity. God made me. I need to pursue excellence. I need to try and do my best and use the gifts that God made me to become a better person and serve my country, serve the church, serve uh, European civilization, whatever. Right? So you can see here the education that this is meant to impact and how ideas of religion are changing, perhaps. But we can't say, well, the Renaissance was not religious. It was secular as opposed to the Middle Ages. Sorry, I'm going to keep hammering that point home because I'm amazed at how many times people misunderstand this. Um, one thing a student pointed out to me, and I think they're right. What's fascinating is this looks like a brain. Right. This looks like, it looks like God surrounded by angels is like within a brain. And I don't think that's an accident. This is also a time period when they were exploring human anatomy. And I think this is meant to emphasize human beings are so awesome, we can uh, use our brains to understand God. We can use our reason to understand God, which has its roots in the Middle Ages, but it's just being expanded. And to kind of really emphasize this and to also show how they're looking back to Greco-Roman ideas, here's a medieval version of David, right? This is King David. It's nice. It's better than what I could do, but it's not particularly inspiring to me. This is Michelangelo and the Renaissance David. This is impressive, I think, right? Again, David's very buff. And you can see here where they're looking back to Greco-Roman ideas of beauty, right? This is meant to be kind of a Greek-style King David. But the idea here, again, is this. It's glorifying humanity, right? This is how awesome human beings are. And in the Renaissance... Following the destruction of the Black Death, of plague, of millions of people dying, you see this reassertion, which once again combines classical learning with Christianity to develop a idea of humanity is awesome and fills people full of confidence. What can't human beings do? And this plays a very important role, I think, in encouraging Europeans to go out, to expand, Right? There's this idea in the Renaissance, we want knowledge. And there's this confidence too, we can get it. We're going to go wherever we can to learn. Because if we do that, we can learn useful things. And what I think is fascinating is how expansive their idea of useful things was. It wasn't just math and science. Awesome things, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything bad about that. math and science. They're awesome. I know they're awesome because I teach about the scientific revolution and all the wonderful things it brings. But they expanded to also include art, music, literature, beautiful things that can inspire us to be better people. And this is key to one reason why the Renaissance is going to help lead into the age of exploration, the joy of the old and new worlds. There's a sense of confidence. And also, of course, the money <laughs> that is the foundation of all this stuff, right, is being developed by people like Lorenzo de' Medici. So there's this spread of knowledge. And I don't want you to think the Renaissance is only an Italian thing. It spreads, right? It's centered in Italy, but it's going to spread out. And to give you a sense, right, there's going to be these connections outside of Italy. And one of them's in modern day Germany. You'll have this guy, Johannes Gutenberg, who's going to develop the printing press, right? He's going to develop the printing press. Why is that important? It allows for relatively cheaper books to be produced. So let me explain something to you. One thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, at times in medieval churches, the Bible was chained up in the church. And people looked at that and said, oh yeah, the church didn't want people to have access to the Bible. And that's not true. The reason they chained up the Bible is because the Bible costs as much as the church. 
before the printing press, if you wanted a copy of a book, you had to copy it. It could take a monk a whole year to copy a Bible. Now, monks work cheap. They basically work for free, but you still got to feed them and clothe them. And you got to give them the equipment they need to write. But imagine that. To get a copy of the Bible, it takes a person one year. And if you want a beautiful Bible, such as what would be suitable to have in a church to be used during Mass and so forth, it had to be decorated beautifully. So a Bible could cost as much as a church. But with the development of the printing press, you could have a machine that prints the Bible very quickly or any other book. And that allows for relatively cheaper books to produce. That means more and more people have access to knowledge. So you can start having people buy Bibles and have them in their homes. And the reason I keep talking about the Bible is because the first book to be printed was a Bible um, here by Johannes Gutenberg. And also eventually Bibles will get so cheap that you can buy one to carry in your pocket. Right. So this is very important. So more people now can have access to books and have an incentive to read. Right. Why would you bother to think about this way? Can you afford a plane? Probably not. So why would you learn to fly a plane? You're not going to learn to fly a plane unless either A, you want to become a pilot for a job, or B, you're going to buy a plane. You're probably not going to have enough money to buy a plane. I certainly don't. So you're not going to buy a plane. You're not going to learn to fly. Well, what's the point of learning to read if you can't get books? So what happens is, as books become cheaper, more people have access to books, and therefore more people will learn to read. It becomes realistic to actually get books to read. So more and more people are going to learn how to read. So again, Europeans want to spread knowledge. They want to learn. Like I said, the first book to be printed will be the Bible, but other books will be printed as well that will spread knowledge. And what's really striking is one book that's going to be printed is called The Travels. And this book is describing the travels of Marco Polo, this guy who started off in Venice and traveled all the way to China under the rule of Kublai Khan. We mentioned him briefly before. Who's going to read that book and be inspired? Christopher Columbus. Right? One thing that will inspire Christopher Columbus to go out and explore is reading the travels of Marco Polo. So again, Europeans have this thirst for knowledge. It can be traced back to the Middle Ages and before. It's encouraged by the love of the Greco-Roman tradition. But the fact is that Europeans are learning they want knowledge, they see it as useful, and they want to know more. And it's that drive to know more, to get useful knowledge, such as how do we get down to this very wealthy country of China and trade with them directly that's going to help lead to the age of exploration and will lead to Europe joining together the old and new worlds and will lead to growing economic power and prosperity.